good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the ones that made it uh, until Friday afternoon for this talk. My name is Thomas. Um, these are not my slides. Um, and I'm coming from Barcelona, but I'm actually from Venezuela. And I'm going to talk to you talk to you about a little project that we're running together with a group of people around the world uh, called Fab City, uh, which is somehow the articulation of the emerging maker movement and how the spread of Fab Labs and digital fabrication tools and people making are kind of challenging the way the economy works and the way we somehow understand cities today. Are the places where we live, uh, we work and play somehow in an eight by eight by eight model which comes from the industrial uh, era. And in, under this indu new industrial, um, I would say, shift of paradigm, uh, the question is what it means to live in a city where you can actually, you don't need to only, you don't have to work, um, you play while working, and, uh, and you live uh, just by you know, solving your needs with your own means and with your own resources. So um, I don't know if I have my slides. Uh, yes, uh, but I wanted to start with a, you know, with this uh, idea, no? Like uh, the future is an idea of the past. Basically, we have been talking for many years about the future and how it would look like, and in the meantime, we had been uh, losing somehow the touch with the reality, and we're thinking of possible futures, and and somehow um, other people has been faster than us on taking the present, no? So I, I encourage uh, for you to think about this talk as, uh, as, a, as an invitation for you to take action today and stop thinking about the coming future and what AI and, 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 and the emerging technologies are going to do to you. But I wanted to also start to say that I am from Venezuela. Um, I studied uh, urbanism in Venezuela um, um, at the Universidad Simón Bolívar. It's a country well known by the nature, by Miss Universe, and by, unfortunately, Chavez. And the challenges that we have uh, in, our, in our country today are, are huge. No? We, we are now in the edge of a civil war coming from the concentration of power and resources by a group of delinquents and narco traffickers, which is the Venezuelan government at the moment. And a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about is about you know, claiming back that power and trying to avoid, uh, basically, the confrontation between society and the brutal forces. I think that the fight that is being happening in Venezuela during the last 100 days could be taken at the world scale very soon if we don't do things differently. Um, but fortunately, uh, 11 years ago, I moved to Barcelona, where I knew the world of Fab Labs. I co-founded Fabla Barcelona, and I became co-founder of the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia. And somehow out of the combination of my studies and digital fabrication, uh, the Fab City project uh, was born as a, as, a, you know, as a common idea between many people that is trying to make it happen around the world. So there is something that, you know, we're, we're in a way, we are kind of reiterating ideas that are not somehow invented today. No, we talk about bottom-up, top-down, about productive citizens, about productive cities, as this would be something new, but for centuries even, uh, thinkers and makers have been trying to crack the nut about these uh, fundamental ideas. What is happening today is actually a lot of these kind of philosophical approaches and, and even somehow like uh, idealistic approaches to what the city could be are becoming real and possible with the tools that we have today, and that's what I want to explain. So Jane Jacobs, Basically, and you know, an American writer and, um, but also activist was trying to stop the you know the, the rules of the market to take uh, New York City uh, back in the 60s and the 70s, and she stood against uh, Robert Moses in one of the well-known uh, fights in the world of urbanism. And somehow, I think that you know we keep her ideas, but the, the, that battle was somehow lost. No, we have now the cities are market-driven as many other aspects of our lives, no? Um, but in a way, this idea of the, of the, of the cities produ produced by citizens at the same time the, ended, ended up happening in an unexpected way, no? Uh, for instance, this is a picture of, of, of uh, one of the largest favelas or barrios or, or, or slums in the world in Caracas, and this is a city made by its own citizens. 
And now even accepted as part of a formal city, if you see there is a cable car, yesterday Juan Carlos was talking about the Medellin cable car, this is similar to that mass transportation system connected with that self-made city, in this case in, in, in Caracas. This is another example about a self-made city. This is a vertical occupation of a, of a bank tower in the city of Caracas as well. This is Torre de David, in which people by their own means and with their own hands, they took the city. So, you know, there's people that have been producing their own city for, 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 for years, for decades, for centuries. So, this is another way of occupating the city as well, uh, which is by uh, basically taking the public space, using different means, in this case, the articulation of through digital technologies in order to have a political voice, in this case, on Tahrir Square in, uh, in Egypt in the last, um, uh, in, the, in the Arab Spring, that again, unfortunately, is another battle that seems to be lost at the moment. Um, so I want to make honor to this. I, I thought that this uh, graph was not going to be shown, but in the very first talk was shown by Mike. So I wanted to honor it again, uh, the famous uh, um, diagram of how it comes of, uh, you know, how networks could, uh, could be operating in, in this, on these topologies, no? the three different topologies from centralized to decentralized to distributed. And I think that now we are in a way in the tension between the two extremes. And we are not, I think that it's, it's impossible to say if the communications, power, economy is, is actually part of each one of these, net, these topologies. But we are in a very, very strange situation at the moment and, and, and in which um, I think that the fundamental models probably need to be even uh, re-understood. No? So um, this one of the main challenges and, and probably one of the main disruptions that we're seeing today and how things are shifting is the digital life, no? the, digitis, the digitization of almost every aspect of our lives and, and through new means. No? In this way, in, the, in terms of information and communications, we have been able to enable ourselves with new tools to enhance our capabilities by using uh, new assets, um, um, you know, computers in our pockets that allow us to have a different interaction with the reality and be part of the production or the interpretation of that reality as we're doing with media. No? So this is a type of em a technological empowerment that we have been living for the last uh, decades. Not very long time ago, we just incorporated things like this that become like a fundamental tools for you to get in touch with the ones you love or to share content with the world, or basically to do your communication of the projects that you're running. But the fundamental question here is, if, is, is what we want to do with these uh, tools. No? If it's, we're going towards uh, dependence on technology, or we are really going to be empowered through technology. And these are questions that are around our heads. No? And when you take the possibilities of the digital and what it has been causing in terms of uh, information and, and, and in computation especially, when you take it to the physical world, then the questions are even bigger. No? What happens when digital tools allow us to, to change the physical reality? And this is what we are doing inside uh, fab labs or fabrication laboratories and trying to connect the physical and the digital worlds uh, basically by using digital fabrication tools and also challenging, um, you know, somehow the way we access the, to the means of production. No? Basically, during the last uh, 150 years, the accumulation of the means of production has allowed to create the current economy. What happens when these means of production are accessible to everyone is basically, basically um, changing um, everything somehow. No? So, this started as an as a outreach project. This network started as an outreach project out of the Center for Bits and Atoms at, at MIT um, around um, a decade ago. And now it became like a global network in more than 1,000 fab labs uh, in almost every country. We run uh, educational programs like the Fab Academy or the, Bio, the Machines That Make Machines project or the Bio Academy, trying to learn how to make almost anything, but also trying to learn how to grow almost anything and incorporate uh, synthetic biology technologies and the future of making things, which is going to be actually growing things. No? So from Fabula Barcelona, we have been working on a few projects, basically thinking on different scales of operation, from not just being a lab, for look, but looking, you know, what is the kind of impact that we can create beyond our, our walls? No? How, how do you go from a lab of geeks, you know, locked in the room, safe, playing with code and with electronics and, and playing with 3D printers and actually go out of those walls and get in, 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 in exchange with the reality, and not only exchange and trying to manage the reality, but trying to change the reality. Um, and, and we have been doing it for, through a few 
few projects, especially in our lab in Barcelona. I'm going to be very quick about the smart city sync project. This is a sensor we develop, um, we have been developing for the last six years or so. Um, it's an open source hardware, but also platform and API that allows people to capture data, share it uh, with the world, uh, but also build on top of that um, uh, somehow other tools um, in order to develop your own custom applications somehow. No? So we are enabling people to make things, enabling technologies to actually transform the way we make things. And Mara is sitting here. She has been uh, leading the Making Sense project, which has been using smart citizen technology to actually improve the engagement strategies with citizens in order to basically use, in this case, open source technology as a, as a political tool for people to make action to uh, improve the uh, public space and somehow to transform the reality. No? Uh, in Barcelona, the whole process of the project has been going from you know, training the trainers to creating a community to developing a conversation and dialogue with authorities and now it's going to an action into transforming the public plaza, of plaza, uh, the public plaza del Sol into a new public space taken by the neighbors of, of Gracia in Barcelona. This is happening uh, right now. So, Another project, which is an open source platform, this is FabLabs.io, which is kind of a Facebook of the FabLabs, if you want to call it, but it's open source, you can download it from GitHub. Um, uh, we have been developing also for the last uh, four years, and which people have, you know, we have more than 11,000 people registered and more than 1,000 FabLabs, and this allows uh, the network to exchange projects and create somehow something that we believe could be a potential global economy in which information travels, but actually the materials are produced locally. So you can design something in Barcelona and sell it in Lima without having to put it in a shipping container and, and use fossil fuels and, and use other uh, supply chains. So in a way, we are you know, introducing a, a new form of design and a new form of production that somehow challenges the linear economy. And you have heard probably many times around the circular economy. I prefer to talk about the spiral economy in a way uh, in which, you know, would you have a purpose somehow? No, it's not circular economy since that it tries to capture things, while I think spiral should look into evolve things into a, into a better scenario. So the way people is designing today and creating new projects are, are basically disrupting the traditional way they have been done before. Now people like Jason doing the shower loop, some of the projects featuring the POC21, which is one of a sister project of Wisher, or Acre doing open source farming tools. Projects that have been using open source technologies uh, like Arduinos, uh, Fab Labs, like uh, Red Wraps and precious plastic machines in order to transform the way we produce food, the way we produce energy, the way we filter water, the way we have, uh, the way we produce technology itself. No? But you would say, okay, this low, these things look clumsy and I don't know if I want to really, you know, resign to the use of my really nice IKEA design uh, uh, furniture, but actually this is how uh, your mobile phone, your shiny mobile phone looked 30 years ago, no? So, in a way, what we have been trying to do is, through these small manifestos, which are these projects, we have been trying to open a vision on how cities would look like if we are able to make anything that we need inside the cities. And that's what Fab City has been trying to do. Basically by, um, you know, reframing the way we produce things, thinking about a productive ecosystem as a multi-scalar multi and complementary ecosystem that goes from the 3D printer in your house, to your fab lab in your neighborhood, to the flexible factory in your city, to the global supply chains. No? So somehow, where do you place a product, what you want to have access to it, how you're going to make it, what you're gonna, what you're gonna, what, which are going to be the transaction models in a, in, a, in a city in which you can just walk directly to the factory where it could be made uh, in, in terms of hours. No? So we are prototyping this in Poleno in Barcelona, which is known as a, one of the old industrial uh, neighborhoods. And this is a video I wanted to show you, but I won't have time. But this uh, last summer, we did an experiment with IKEA designers and, um, and, and in collaboration with the Space 10 uh, IKEA Innovation Lab in Copenhagen. And we brought them to the Poleno neighborhood in Barcelona in order for them to experiment with the future of production to, in a business like IKEA. IKEA is probably the retailer, the on, one of the only retailers that owns the supply chains in the world, one of the largest. As you know, Amazon or Alibaba, they don't own the supply chains. IKEA 
kind of does. They do a lot of distributed manufacturing as well. And we've been it's okay, you can put it down the volume. Into a position it's okay. A very so passive form. what we did is actually make the IKEA designers to collect the furniture that they designed to be trash very quickly. Uh, so they went out of the neighborhood, collect the furniture, took it back to the Fab Labs in the Poblano, and then remade other products and put it back again for other people to take it. No? So in a way, this was a spark for uh, IKEA to start to understand that their business model is going to move from being a warehouse of products that have sh traveled thousands of kilometers to be flat pack, and you, when you buy it, be part of, ass of the assembly line, which is the genius model of IKEA. They, became, they made us part of the assembly line, which is, I, I think is genius, um, to go uh, to start the transition to a model in which probably IKEA goes back to the city centers I guess that you have read a lot of press releases about that in the last year or so. It comes from this reflection. But not to make, uh, let's say, sh uh, showrooms in the centers of the city, but actually IKEA becoming flexible factories in the center of the city, so they produce on demand products designed by city centers, probably used in virtual reality and so on. No? So this was prototyping the Made Again Challenge. You can read more about that in the Fab City website and the Fab City blog. So, this is the idea of a Fab City prototype. Again, in the Poblenou, it's been happening. Francesca Bria, the CTO of Barcelona, was talking about that. It's now rebranded or somehow called also the Maker District as part of the digital development plan of the city. And we have been trying to do this as a larger, in a, as an, in a larger scale, trying to apply to a European Union funding. And the European Union thought that this was not good enough to fund it. Uh, but we're going to make it happen anyways, uh, somehow. Um, and this, is, this leads also to the idea of you know, this turning into a global network of cities that is not only Barcelona and Poblano and the failed European project, but actually um, you know, out of a challenge that we launched in Barcelona in 2014, we have now a group of cities uh, that follow the challenge for having, for having the in, uh, infrastructure in place for cities to produce everything they consume by 2054. So this is the former mayor of Barcelona pressing a button uh, that is a, a, a countdown that now is 37 years by, that has been followed somehow by the mayor of Boston, Marty Walsh, by the mayor of Amsterdam and the Fab City prototype that we did last year in the, uh, um, the presidency of uh, the Netherlands of the European Union, which so, uh, also Shenzhen being part of a Fab City, Paris, that is going to host the Fab 14 event uh, around Fab City as well, together with Toulouse, with Toulouse, Detroit, Michigan, which is the icon, iconic city of the assembly line, and the compromise of the mayor, uh, Michael Dugan, Santiago de Chile, that is, that is hosting the Fab 13 this year, and Bhutan, that is the only country that measures the happiness of their citizens. They are part also of the Fab City. They are opening the first Fab Lab, actually, these days. I think it's next week. So. This is a network of people rather than cities and fab labs. It's people making this happen. Uh, a lot of the people is in this room now. Um, and this is how, what it looks today. It's 12 cities, two regions, two countries. It's quite uh, unique. Um, and we're trying to, you know, developing tools to measure the impact that we're doing together to create a platform ecosystem that enabling a digital economy using potentially blockchain, which Benjamin loves. And, um, and, you know, basically doing the transition from an extractive economy to a productive economy, basically the model is that we are trying to move from is the PITO, in which cities import products and export trash, to a model in which materials stay in the city and information travels around the world, which is data in, data out, or DIDO. So information flows globally, but materials flow locally. They're looking at me because I'm stealing time. And this is the, la the last project I want to show, which is out of idea and a discussion with my students in London, uh, I came, we say, okay, why we don't do a crazy project which is 3D print uh, in space um, using the breeze and using zero, zero gravity 3D printing technologies? No, wait a second. And it, it was like uh, nine months ago, uh, they, they say they, you're crazy, but actually we're working now with uh, Fab Foundation and the CBA on developing a, a Fab Lab concept to go for deep exploration, go to Mars and 3D print your sheet out there in the space. So with that, I think that now is the panel moment. I will try to talk very little in the panel then, uh, because I stole my time. Thank you. 